I'm not sure where to start except to say that I've been historically concerned with the present in the way in which what the title says, the paradox of research, that the good intentions are of inclusion actually are ways of thinking about how you exclude, divide, and object. So let me begin to see if this works. Um, I'm going to focus on two kinds of research that I've been looking at. One uh, in a Swedish, actually two Swedish projects with Daniel Pedersen, who's somewhere around here, and Sverker Lindblad, who's not here, um, looking at international assessments and OECD. The other one will be looking at the teacher education research, which talks about effective teacher, core practice, and so on. And why am I looking at them? They look like they're very different. One is macro statistical, the other is built upon examining the communication processes in classrooms. I'm gonna argue they're both the same. In terms of the way in which they deal with the construction of knowledge, and in that construction, the way in which divisions and differences are produced. Um, I'm going, I will use the word because it's sort of a nice one. I'm going to do what I, it can be called the anthropology of reason. That is to think about Dewey's work, how we think, but not like Dewey. To think about it as a social and historical phenomenon. That is the way in which we organize and think and construct and objectify the world is a historical process. Um, and I'm trying to use research as my empirical analysis. That is to treat the products of research as historical artifacts. Um, if I had to say where I belong, I, I mean, it's what some people will call in between. I'm in between cultural sociology, history, philosophy, and curriculum studies, and maybe a few other things I don't know. Um, all right, what do I mean by reason? Um, I'm gonna draw upon Ian Hacking, who talks about styles of reasoning, and I'm gonna think about it like clothes. When you put on a pair of clothes, it's a way of being. And these photos, and a lot of what I'm gonna do, by the way, is through images, because it's much easier sometimes to, con to convey ideas through images than uh, using text, um, although I'll use text too. Each of these styles of clothes say something about who we are, but also who we should be, and again, who doesn't fit. And it's important to understand those three things as they go together, because language does that to us. The language we have is not only about what is, it also is about what should be, but also about what's objective, doesn't belong. Um, and I'm going to look particularly at research that's related to reform and policy, and in order to place it to understand how it orders what we know, and in that knowing, desires. And I'm not talking psychologically about desires, I'm talking about how the very way we construct knowledge orients us as desires about what should be actualized. And I'm going to also say, and this is maybe part of the historical, that the very notion of this desire has been embedded in the social sciences since the 1800s in what were called the moral sciences, which study deviance, which gets back to the topic of the conference, but also of my talk about inclusion and exclusion. And I'm going to also maybe reverse a lot of this discussion that tends to go on. I'm going to see the research itself as an actor, not the people who produce it, although they're important in producing it, but that the very way in which the knowledge gets organized acts on us. And I'll play with that later on in terms of cybernetics and systems theory, which is what ties together both the uh, OECD PISA, but also the teacher research. All right, believe it or not, I'm on my second point. And there are, I think six, the six is really a conclusion. All right. What I want to do now is focus on the problem of reform science. 
And I want to argue that it makes kinds of people. What do I mean makes kinds of people? Basically, it means that when we talk about the child as an adolescent or talk about childhood, it's a way of thinking about a kind of person. It's not something that's there, but it becomes there and it has a materiality to it. What do I mean by materiality? That is, and I'll get to this with G. Stanley Hall, who with child studies, it's a way of thinking about the problems of the world, but those ways of thinking enter into the world and you begin acting on it as though they're there. All of my kids were adolescent. In that sense, it has a materiality. All right, what do I mean by styles of reasoning? This comes, some of you who know me, it's familiar, but it's useful. This is a box of uh, Nutrigrain, which is fairly common now in a lot of different places. It's a fast food. It's, but on it, it has all this stuff about if you eat it, it's a way of staying healthy. And my way of thinking about it is not what it says, but it's a way of constructing what it means to be a healthy person. That is, to make a kind of person who is healthy. And if you look at the box, you realize it intersects and assembles multiple different kinds of discourse. It's a political discourse, which is the, the um, chart there is mandated by government. It's a scientific discourse, which tells you how many calories, how many trans fats, and so on. It also is an image of the family, which is on the box. It also is a projection of, um, in the US of a way of rethinking collective belonging through representation of groups that weren't there. Um, and the idea of this notion of the healthy person, if you eat this kind of food, if you uh, use, don't use styrofoam when you get coffee, um, all of this helps to create a healthy person but a healthy, healthy world. It's a kind of person. And I'm going to put this up as a counterexample, not because it, today it, it's not as pure as it was, say, back in earlier China, but if you think about Yang Shen, it's a different way of thinking about a kind of person, a healthy person. It's a different notion of a different logic, a different rationality about what it means to be a particular kind of person that's valued, but it's a social and cultural and political discourse. It's just not about a healthy person. Now, why is it, am I focusing on this healthy person? One, very clearly, educational discourse is very clearly developed with notions of medicine and health as a way of thinking about who the child is. But this is why I want to do it. Embodied in this notion of health is what's not there, but also is there. That is, who's not the healthy person. And the images, I think, very quickly do this for you. Um, it shows you that even though you're not thinking of it, it's there. If someone is eating um, sort of a lot of sweets, you say you shouldn't be doing that. So this image of the health is also an image of what's not healthy. And what I want to pursue through the PISA and I want to through teacher education research is how this notion of the other is embedded in the notion of the normal. Let me go back a little bit to American progressivism, but I could go back into the 19th century, which some of you I know have done, and looked at the formation of pedagogy in, in Europe, but I'll use the US. In the US is a period which is called very often the progressive education and very often associated with Dewey. What I want to do is place that more into a historical way of thinking. The, Dewey and other members of the Chicago sociology, which he, it was influence, was very much involved in trying to understand what do you do with the urban situation. What's the urban situation? You had a lot of immigrants, you had people coming up from the South, African Americans, and they were going into the school. You had also religion, and it's interesting when you look at the settlement house movement, which was also in Germany and Denmark and, and through Scandinavia. I'm not sure it was in the southern part of um, Europe, but Neither to say it was also a religious movement. It was trying to bring Christian ethics into social policy through social science, although it wasn't necessarily social science at that point. And you also had a lot of strife. In the US, you had labor movements, and these labor movements were considered a threat. And so when you look at the early sociology and psychology, it was a response to what was called the social question. What do you, how do you deal with the conditions of the city, 
by the way, this, the conditions of the city were the conditions of particular populations because the people who were doing this were also living in the city, but they were the urbane cosmopolitan people. Um, and so you had community sociology at University of Chicago where Dewey was, was very important, and psychology. The reason I put this book up, the cover, it's a book by G. Stanley Hall. G. Stanley Hall was one of the founders of the child study movement in the US. There were other movements like this in Europe as well. And if you look at the title, it's very, it's very interesting and telling to see how science gets constructed from, again, the 19th century to the present through notions of deviance. What's the title? Adolescence, it's psychology. Do, uh, Hall was very much concerned with the kids coming to school who before weren't coming to school. It's the beginning of, in the US of mass schooling. Um, and then he says it's the relation to physiology, anthropology, and sociology. That sounds reasonable. But then when you go to the next line, you realize that this is a moral science. It has to do with sex, crime, and religion because of the fear of people who came into the city. Some of them had the wrong, were religious, and some of them had the wrong religions. And then at the bottom, you can see education. So in this title of the book, without even going into it, you can begin to see how science develops as a notion of difference in the sense of also what's normal. Because all this notion of sex, crime, and religion has to do not only with what's being violated, but underneath that is also what is the normal. And in a way, I'll, I'll talk about this as the relationship of the normal and the pathological. <clears throat> One of the things that happens, which is very much tied to education and educational research, and I'll demonstrate how, is that if you read the history of psychology, and I'm not talking about educational psychology, I'm talking more generally. Although it's interesting in the US, uh, psychology came out of educational psychology, but then it established itself as uh, somewhat different from educational psychology. Um, it talks about, and actually Hall does use the word soul. We think of soul as a religious kind of notion. And what psychology, histories of psychology often say is that they lost the soul and began to develop um, a psychology of the mind because they were scientific, and now the brain. And what I'm going to argue, and I'll give you ample quotes from current research, that the soul was never lost. The soul is talked about as mind, it's talked about habits of mind, and a whole bunch of other things, um, which uh, is the focus of a lot of uh, current research, but also past research. Um, this is from current research. It's core practice, uh, it's called teacher core practice, and it has to do with how do you get teachers to be more effective, and what they're talking about is changing the habits of mind and character that develop new ways of thinking. I mean, that's a, a contemporary way of talking about the soul. It also talks about dispositions that people should, that the, the object of research is to get into the interior of the teacher, of the mind, and develop intrinsic values and virtues of the individual because that's a more powerful concept than beliefs as it can be changed. And also, the important word is assessed, that you can codify and standardize it. These are ways of talking about the soul in a way that we don't realize we're talking about the soul. Okay. So, what I've said so far, at least I think I've said so far, Research is concerned with making kinds of people, and in that making kinds of people are concerned with the construction of differences. One of the objects of change, and this is really also for me very important, you sort of assume that research is about change, but we never really look at what we mean by change. If you look at the current research, change is not only about changing institutions, it's about changing people, and in particularly the interior of the, of the person, the soul. And now I want to move to a way in which this becomes, I'll use the word operationalized, but I use it in sort of a, a sardonic way. Um, in looking at school subjects, that both PISA and the teacher education research believe that they're measuring whether children learn science, mathematics, art, music, et cetera. And I'm going to argue that's not what these subjects are about. And I'm going to argue it through a number of different historical researchers. And if I had another couple of hours, 
I can give you loads of research which looks about how these subjects get into school. They're not to teach science. They're not to teach math. They're to develop a moral child and also related to the social question of how you change populations that are deviant. And this continually gets back to this question of inclusion and exclusion. Okay, let me begin with music education. Why? Because I like the photograph. Um, music education gets into the American schools. This is from a book by uh, Ruth Gustafson. Music education gets into the American schools because there was fear in Boston of the Irish population. There's a book, by the way, which is written, the title of it is called the Ir How the Irish Became White. Because when the Irish came to the US, they were considered as um, uncivilized. And so the question was, how do you deal with this Irish population in Boston? And music education was one way, and they looked at the Prussian music education, um, and they brought it to the US, and it was, um, or they translated it to the US is probably more accurate. And in the US, it was for two reasons. One, it was um, they worried about tuberculosis, and so they had the girls singing. Why singing? Because singing, you breathe a lot, and, and supposedly it clears your, your lungs. You have to have clear air for, the, air for that, but, um, and it would make them healthy. The other thing that they began to do is music appreciation. And this is a book in 1927 um, where uh, someone at University of Iowa, name is Carl Seashore, uh, also involved in eugenics, which is sort of interesting to sort of reflect how much eugenics reflected this early research. Um, look, psychologists did research in their, in their classes, by the way. They didn't go out to schools. That's a post-war phenomenon where you go out to schools and you do mass studies. So he looked at these uh, young men in this class and he played two kinds of music, classical European music and jazz. Why jazz? Jazz was a music thought of that came from African Americans and it was thought that if you listened to jazz it would make you mentally disturbed. And so if you read the quote, this is a quote from the book, that's what he's observing in these photographs. The people who are listening to the classical music are happy, they look energetic and so on, and the ones who are listening to jazz, they're in trouble. Um, and so you could see how this idea of music, by the way, he also developed a test of music uh, ability, which is still being used, by the way. Um, and so you could see how the school subjects that are being measured by these uh, core teacher practices, but also by PISA, have nothing to do with knowing science, math, or literacy. They have to do with how do you develop collective belonging. We can call it the citizen, but also who is not, doesn't represent that notion of the citizen. Um, this is, and I'll do this relatively quickly. In, well, it's probably 15, 20 years ago, I did a study across the US of a new teacher education program. And it was in rural and urban areas in the US and schools that dealt with marginalized populations, what we call marginalized populations. What was so interesting to me in it, you could see how differences get constructed, but also how the language we have from, and it's of research, but it's not only research, it's also of schooling, um, is built upon a certain notion of urban deviance. So at one level, you could say that the urban teachers are different from the rural teachers, and you have loads of research which talks about urban education and you have other research which talks about um, rural education. But around the country when I went to these schools, whether it was in rural North Carolina or whether it was in Bedford-Stuyvesant in Brooklyn, teachers had only one language to speak. They had only one set of distinctions. Geographically they were different, but discursively they were very similar. And you can begin to see how the sciences we use are developed through a notion of deviance and difference. Um, Jacques Rancière has a nice book where he talks about um, how we've developed a, the sciences on the notion of inequality. And his argument there is that we should maybe start thinking about equality rather than inequality as a way of understanding e inequality. But um, that's an argument for another one. Um, so the question I'm asking, what are these things measuring? Are they measuring mathematics? And this is from Pisa. And you can see in these, in the reason I put these three different graphs there, you have the graphs of nations. 
But those graphs of nations, and this is the project that we're working on in Sweden now as well, you realize that all these numbers, all these equivalences, all these notions of differences uh, that look like they're macro notions of nations are built upon generalized notions of what people are and also generalized notions of what society should be that then get uh, built upon, and in PISA they're doing it now on well-being measures. What makes a child succeed by being well-being? And these are ways of thinking about a certain kind of universalized child, but also society, from which you begin to understand differences. Uh, Susan Robertson talked about this yesterday in terms of the flattening of the world through the notion of way in which these equivalents are developed. They're very interesting to look at pieces to see how they develop it, because what they do is take differences, and then they develop another kind of statistics, which then take those differences, make them into equivalences, and then look at differences so you can have these kinds of, of graphs. Um, and here I want to bring up, again, why history becomes important. The, the work of uh, Katrina Martin, she looked at how these international measures are built upon notions of development and then traced it back into the notion of 19th century, the idea of development itself, and how that notion is, was brought into art education and drawing as a methodological device um, and statistical device that was not only um, to represent, but it was also diagnostic to tell the difference between the normal and not normal. The last example I want to give is from uh, Malin Idelin. Uh, it's a book that's coming out soon. It's called, um, what's it called? The uh, Echo Certified Child. It's about sustainable uh, education in Sweden. And what you realize, and what her book very clearly delineates, is how this notion of what science is to make an uh, ecological safe world is really a nationalism. And in that nationalism is a particular kind of image of what it means to be Swedish. She calls it Swedish exceptionalism, but you could also look at it in terms of American exceptionalism, Italian exceptionalism, German, and so on. And in that, in Swedish, it's the image that everybody rides a bike, there are windmills, everybody's saving on uh, energy, uh, and of nature is very important. But in that image of what it means to be Swedish is also a notion of consumption. And in that notion of consumption, is who doesn't consume in the right way, and those are the people who are not ECHO-certified. And you begin to see how differences and divisions and exclusions and objections begin to be produced in trying to develop um, the good intentions. All right, two more points. I may even finish before I go home. Um, I realize, this is part of it, by the way, I should say this, um, a, a larger project in a book I'm writing. And I realized in writing the book that I've been a long time writing about how science is not about the present, it's about the future. And I began playing with the notion of desire and, then, and relationship to Deleuze's notion of desire, which I said before, is not about the psychology that you desire, but how certain ways of thinking orient you about what should be. And in that also is a notion of um, potentiality, which is nicely uh, sort of argued through Agamden's work. And, but in this notion of desire is also the desire of what is not, or what shouldn't be. And so I want to illustrate how this desire gets into research in a way we don't recognize it, and in that way of getting into research also produces its exclusions and objections. There we go. All right, this is from another, it's a book now, it was a dissertation on mathematics by Jenny Diaz. And what Jenny did was look at the changing notion and conceptions of the child in mathematics education. And what she took was, and started with a very simple observation, which I found when she told me about it was really interesting to think about. The mathematics, and this is primary, mathematics is always brought into the curriculum as a discursive practice. So you, yes, you have numbers, but the numbers have to have language associated with it to get kids to sort of develop and understand its relevance. 
but one of the key symbols of mathematics is the equal sign. But at least in the US, but I don't think it's only in the US, the equal sign is also a political symbol about equality, about justice, and so on. And these other things that I put up there are part of those political images of equality. And then she looked at, and I just took one part of it, uh, contemporary uh, curriculum on elementary school mathematics. And she found these are the characteristics that are embedded in the curriculum. Now, look at them. I'm not going to read them, but you can see this has almost nothing to do with mathematics. The generalized, universalized characteristics of a kind of person that's desired. Because no one person is that. It's a, and this is the, the research that's done in mathematics education relates and, and develops these kinds of characteristics as the mathematically able person. But then you have to realize the mathematically able person has nothing to do with mathematics. Because if you take free thinking or you take um, being abstract, these are general characteristics that you assume is sort of a cosmopolitan person of the, of the contemporary world. Why is it important, these characteristics, in terms of what I'm talking about? is that first, they have nothing to do with mathematics. So when both the core practice teaching and also the um, OECD say they're measuring mathematics, they're not measuring mathematics. They're measuring and codifying and standardizing ways of thinking about kinds of people, and in that, kinds of communities and kinds of societies. Um, and so I'm using desire and here in a way, and I, I've said this, that it has to do with how you actualize the experiences of the present as a way of thinking about the future. And it also carries in it, and I'll use the word double gestures, because they, they're together, they're not separate. The double gesture is that this, uh, you, these characteristics are the potentialities of what should be. At the same moment, they're also the potentialities of who's not that. So if you're not rational, and rational, by the way, is a very relational word and historical word, or you, you don't seem intelligent, which I'm not sure what that means, the opposite of that is embedded in the word. And it has to do with a particular kind of way we use language. All right, how are these desires manifested in OECD? Very simple. And it's interesting, once you begin looking at these things, you realize they're there. If you don't look at it, you just assume. They become part of the common sense. Pisa's thoughts is that they've, they're measuring for the future participation in society. And this is a quote from them. You could read it. I won't read it to you. But that's really arrogant that somehow Pisa knows what the future of society is going to be. But it's, it's a desire. It's a potentiality as Deleuze uses it. They also say that they're preparing, preparing students for, by, for the future by the use of mathematics. Again, it's a desire. It's not an actuality in the sense that PISA has done no empirical studies of how mathematics is even being used today outside of education to understand what is going to prepare people for the future. And the last one, which I love, is the global competence. Um, I travel a lot, and I realize that um, even in my travel, I don't have cultural and global competence. I'm really incompetent. And sometimes I don't even know how to use the proper utensils or things to eat. Um, but somehow Pisa knows it. My point is, um, <laughs> these are desires built into the methodologies and the theories we use when we're engaged in research. And we don't recognize it because it becomes part of the good intentions. Because it, it's, it's the way we think about why the world is really not the way we want it. And let me tell you, coming from the US, I could say that even stronger today. Um, and also, what's, we want the world to become, but we don't recognize it. And it's not what I'm getting at, by the way, is that these good intentions are, uh, I'll say, paradoxical, because the very way we think about theory, we think about science, we think about research, we think about methods, actually work against those commitments. Um, I just threw this in because I had to, um, because tied to this is the notion of empirical, empirical science, ev evidence, and so on. There's no notion of evidence or science or empirical evidence unless you tie it to a style of thinking. So in, in effect, if you read at all the history of science, you realize that what's a fact is made a fact by the way in which you think about what data and facts are. It doesn't mean things don't exist. It doesn't mean there's not an ontic world. There aren't things happening but you have to put it under some description. And so that 
when they, uh, when these research programs talk about empirical evidence, they, it, it, I think Lumen talks about it, it's self-referential. And you have to understand the self-referentiality of, in the way in which science becomes its evidence. And so when Pisa is talking about its evidence, it's related to its way of, of organizing the world and phenomena. The core practice is not any different because they're also talking about um, changing and actualizing desires that are embedded in the way in which they engage in the research. And these quotes are from different research reports. Remember earlier I said I'm using the research reports as cultural artifacts. Um, I, I'll take one, the, um, well, I'll take the first one. To change the teacher's habits of mind and character that develop new ways of thinking. Um, new ways of thinking is that, in a sense, to actualize something that's not there. And it's not exactly what they're thinking. Um, OK. I'm going to do this one in 10 minutes so that you can, at least I finish by 12 a little bit before, and maybe we'll have time. What I want to deal with is cybernetics in uh, systems. And the reason I want to deal with it, it's a more systems theory emerges in the 1920s. It becomes sort of really popular after World War II. It's really interesting that systems theory and cybernetics get rejected by uh, some of the sciences, like computer sciences, but it gets deeply involved, embedded in the social sciences, whether it's sociology, whether it's anthropology. Uh, Jerome Bruner in Cognitive Psychology writes about cybernetics as a way of thinking about cognitive psychology, which is extremely influential uh, in the US. Um, and um, the reason I want to deal with it is that both the, the teacher education research, the teacher research, and OECD, both are built upon notions of systems and cybernetics. It's so deeply embedded in them that they don't have to talk about it because it, it's become so much part of the common sense. But why is it important? And I'm just going to make one point about it, and then I'll pursue that point. Systems theory is built upon, theoretically, a notion of equilibrium and disequilibrium. Equilibrium is that you find the um, optimal or maximum way of, of getting efficiency. It's not looking for pure efficiency, but optimal efficiency. And the equilibrium is when all parts are in harmony. So it's about stability. And what you look for when you're doing systems analysis is what produces the disequilibrium. That is, what throws it out? Why isn't the teacher being a good teacher? Why isn't the child, why is there an achievement gap? These are all built upon indirectly systems thought. Now, what happens when this equilibrium and disequilibrium move into social and cultural and educational theory? It becomes a way of understanding what's normal and what's pathological. So that the theoretical that looks neutral in cybernetics, when it becomes part of a discursive way of talking about people, is no longer that. It has to do with the production of exclusions and objections in the effort to include, or what's normal and what's pathological. Uh, these are two diagrams about systems thought. It's very common. You, uh, I realize I did some research on some uh, schools that were developed after uh, in the 70s, and they were totally built upon systems thought, and I never thought about it at the time. The one on the, um, this one is right out of the teacher education research, talking about systems. Um, this is from OECD and also McKinsey reports. I'm not sure which the quote is. So you have in it this idea of normality and pathology. The normality becomes the hope that all children are going to be motivated and their parents interact and communicate it, communi uh, and engage in good communications. And in one report, this is McKinsey, is going to lead to higher youth employment. But then you have the fear that is with the hope, the gesture of hope is also the gesture of fear. And you can see it, there are threats of poor immigrant, ethnic, and racial groups. Um, and then you deal with their psychological and sociological skills, their lack of motivation. This is language right out of the, the reports, by the way. Their lack of motivation, um, disengagement, disheartened, and too poor to study. Now, if you take each of those words, you realize each of them are built upon a notion of what's normal. To be disengaged assumes some notion of engagement. To be motivated or lack of motivation assumes its opposite. Um, this is from the teacher education stuff. And again, it's 
you could see the social question of the 19th century being revisited and it appears as troubled children from fractured, blended, and lone parent families that present teachers with complexity and cultural norms that are different from those of children who come from two family parents. And this is one of the psychologies that they draw upon to talk about when they're looking at teachers. In saying that, you need to always, these I do, you don't have to do anything. But when I look at when they're talking about teachers, teacher research, there's always some notion of the child and the family and the community embedded in that. So if you're talking about an effective teacher, it's effective about what? And the effectiveness has to do with kinds of people. And those kinds of people have to do with not only the child, but the family and the community. This comes out out of, by the way, 19th century community sociology, that you have this tr trilogy of child, family, and community, um, and also their deviance. Okay. <clears throat> What you see in the research is a way in which that differentiation becomes erased. And first of all, it's um, actually Susan talked a little bit about this yesterday with numbers. Um, you have what's called, some people call behavioral datarism. So the, the data seems to be what is telling the truth. And then you have these inscription devices and Latour has a very nice discussion of this which give, oh, you have the feel and, this, and all the, uh, the graphs um, from Pisa uh, illustrate this. You feel like you have an optical consistency for the way you tell truth that you can make comparisons. The problem is it has this notion of arrow of time, that things move in a consistent way that can be organized uh, and engineered. Um, and you also have a shift in what science becomes where earlier science was at least pretended or sought to find general laws, today the future is given as, as, a, as a, uh, um, a truism. And this graph is actually very interesting. This comes out of the Swedish report. Uh, they come, they do a visit, they write a review, they write the report, and then the final objective, they tell Sweden what it's going to do to be a good country in the future. All right, I'm going to now try to conclude this sort of uh, panorama that I try to uh, illustrate. The paradoxes of good intentions of research and change. One of the difficulties of a lot of, of the research I looked at, so I'll be somewhat specific, although I think it has broader implications, that it accepts the objectifications of differences in order to classify and order the present. The problem becomes that the desires in the research obscures the comparative quality that excludes and objects in efforts to include. The social question still lives from the 19th century today, although we have a different language of it, about how dealing with, and we don't call it deviance, and we don't call it pathology, um, but the difference between what well, it becomes embedded in the way we do research, this notion of normality and pathology. And the, the problem was it, is it creates others and it racializes kinds of people. Research for changing social conditions, and this is to me an irony of the history of social science, if you want, is that it's, it, is, it begins trying to change social conditions that ends up trying to design the life of others, which to me is a really odd prescription when thinking about democracy. Let me finish, and this is the last slide. No, I have two more, but the other two have to say why I'm ending. Um, my argument, if I put it in even a broader one, is about the Enlightenment. The Enlightenment gives focus to reason and rationality. A particular kind of common sense has developed, or doxa, that loses sight of other elements of the Enlightenment. Um, Blumenberg, who is, I was told by my friend here, that is a philosopher, I read him as a historian, but that's okay, talked about an important element of the Enlightenment was renunciation. He uses the word renunciation. And I would say disrupting the causality of the present and its doxa. That's an important part of science, it seems to me, um, which is picked up actually, which has also been very valuable in trying to uh, challenge in post-colonial studies, in uh, what's called post-humanism, and, um, and so on, uh, trying to, to challenge the sort of received notions of what the Enlightenment